everyone, welcome back uh, from your reading week, your take a breath week, uh, your week of having a little bit of a break, whatever you want to call it. I hope you used it to both catch up on studies and take some time for yourself, uh, catch your breath for a minute. Your first semester at uni can be uh, pretty intense and maybe this year more than your average year. Uh, this week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. It's not just going to be me uh, rambling on uh, in a little circle in the corner of your screen, but we have uh, two very smart, very interesting people coming that will be uh, talking a bit about representation uh, in economics, particularly in a, in, a, in a racial dimension. But this is something I added to this module just before the semester started, so in just late summer. And I did it because uh, things kind of just came to a head and, and these were conversations that I was having with, uh, with colleagues and uh, with co-authors, with friends of mine about our discipline, about economics and uh, how we teach it and how we talk about it and what we should do about it rather than um, just sort of acknowledging that there's problems. But I thought, what better place to do this than to ha start having this conversation with, with, with all of you uh, in your first year, in your first semester of learning about economics at university. I think these are issues that you should be aware of and uh, be aware of the conversations that are going on uh, within the discipline about the nature of the problem and about what we might do about it. So my interest in, in representation in economics uh, stems in no small part from how academia works. So you probably remember, I hope you remember, uh, in the first week, I gave the little spiel about the nipple of knowledge. You remember the little, the, you, how you learn and you start in school and, and then at university, what we're doing is we're trying to push the very limits of what we know as human beings uh, to create a little bit new knowledge. And I explained the process of peer review so I, as a researcher, I, I write a paper. I think I found something interesting or have evidence about something about the, how the world works. And I write a paper. I send that paper to a journal. And at that journal, there are there is an editor who runs the journal and they will determine whether or not they think, essentially whether the, the question that I've asked is, a, is an interesting question, is a question worth asking. And then they send my paper anonymously to uh, other people in economics, other professors in economics, uh, they read my paper. They think they they determine whether they think the question I asked was a good one, and whether the answer I provided was convincing. Whether they're they're convinced of the answer I provided to the research question that I had, and then the editor decides if there are any changes that need to be made. But once it's published, we sort of say, well, that's now new knowledge. That's how we create new knowledge in in uh, in the academy. Now, that process is quite old. That's how we've done things for a really long time. Uh, it works pretty well, but it also means that there's a lot of power held by the editors of those journals uh, and, and by the referees that those editors choose because the editor, the editor of the journal decides which person to send my paper to, who is going to be the, the referee, who's going to be the person that determines whether or not uh, my paper provides a good answer. And in economics, we have a very strict hierarchy in terms of our journals. So you have lots of different journals you can publish in. Uh, there's five that are, we call them the top five, and they are sort of the big, big economics journals. If you publish in one of these journals, it can make your career. It means it's a really important paper. It's a really important question. You provided a very convincing answer to that question. Uh, and sort of the biggest names in economics, the biggest brains in economics uh, have determined that that is so, and it gets published in one of the top five journals. So what I wanna show you real quick is this picture here. So there are a number of editors at these top five journals. So it's not just one person, but you have different people, they'll have different expertise. So some people will do applied, some people will do micro theory, some people might do econometrics, they'll specialize. So once you have a look, so these are the top five journals, the American Economic Review, Econometrica, the Journal of Political Economy, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, and the Review of Economic Studies. These are really, really hard, hard journals to get into. I've never published in any of these journals, maybe one day. But have a look at these editorial boards. So these are the people that determine whether or not the question that I've asked is a good question, and in no small part, determine whether or not the answer that I've uh, 
produced is a good answer, a convincing answer, and therefore whether or not I have created new knowledge in economics. All right. Now have a look at these editorial boards. Just let your eyes scan over it. See if anything stands out. Sure, first thing, all very attractive group of people, right? Definitely say that, like, look at this. There's not a bad looking person in the bunch. Apart from that, is there anything else that you notice? It's a, it's a, there's a few bald people, that's true. There's a few bald people. Uh, the thing that really jumps out is uh, it is extremely male heavy and it's extremely white male heavy. Right, the editorial boards, the people in economics who are determining whether or not the question that a researcher in economics has asked is a good question and whether or not the answer that they have provided is a compelling answer are almost entirely white men. There's a couple white women. So there's Esther Duflo, who just who won the uh, Nobel Prize, uh, not this, this year, but last year, and a handful of others, but predominantly white men. Now, these are all very smart people. These are all wildly uh, overeducated people. Uh, they're all economics professors at the best universities in the world. I take, uh, you know, I don't take a lot of issue with the work that they do, the quality of the work that they produce. These are very, very good economists. But they're also human beings. They're also people that have particular experiences themselves about how the world works. They have opinions and views of the world based on those experiences, which determine what they will find an interesting or important question. And when you have this group of people that look the way that they do, um, there will be a lot of commonalities in the experiences. There'll be a lot of differences. There's going to be a, a, a rich diversity of experiences among all these white dudes, but they are still all experiencing the world as really smart, really well-educated, uh, high-income white dudes. And I think, and lots of other people think, that that is a problem uh, because it shapes what gets determined to be new knowledge in economics. And it can be a challenge to overcome the experiences, the lived experiences of all of these people that shape their worldviews uh, if you come from a different worldview, if you have a different experience of how the world works. And therefore, uh, there may be questions that you think are important that white dudes just don't think are that important because maybe they've never experienced them. So remember when we talked about GDP, we measure GDP in a particular way because the group of people that determine what should get measured in GDP, they were a bunch of guys, a bunch of very edu highly educated, smart, high income white dudes. And so they measured the things that they thought were important, which were the things that they experienced in their everyday life, the things that them and their peers were doing. So representation in economics, I think, is not just an issue of, uh, oh, we need to make sure we have 50% men and 50% women in a room, is that's the only way that it would be right. I don't necessarily think that that's where we should be aiming for, but it's more than just uh, an academic exercise. It's more than just an idea that, well, you know, balance is good or representation is good for its own sake. Here, when you look at these editorial boards, you see, well, you know, representation matters for determining what matters. You know, having people in the room with different experiences and different ideas of what might be an important question matters for what we end up calling knowledge. So the people that are coming today are going to be talking about the issue of representation in economics, some of the problems that we faced very recently. So this chap here, Professor Harold Ulig, uh, Journal of Political Economy editor, uh, got into a bit of a controversy over the summer during the, the Black Lives Matter protest in the U.S. and, and, and abroad. And I think uh, finally made me snap and said, I thought that was one of that. We have to talk about this this year. We can't ignore this stuff because it's it's just a problem. And, and I think the change starts by teaching you about the problem today rather than when you become a professor of economics at Harvard 10 or 20 years from now. All right, so uh, Kahal and Carolina are going to be talking to us about this this week. So I hope you enjoy their conversation. Do come to the Q&A. They're both really interesting, really smart people. Uh, and there's just a ton, a ton to talk about uh, in this area. 
All right, see you later.